All right, cool. So uh, it has been an absolute joy and an honor to be here. And um, um, uh, how many were you at, uh, at the breakout in the afternoon? Okay. That was fun. But so for the rest of you, just ignore us for a second because I, I have a piece of business that I got to finish that I've been thinking about like, oh, you know, this would, I think this would be helpful also besides what we were working on. And, and that is, what is sin? What is sin? And, um, and inside the context of our conversation, remember, again, all of you who weren't there, forget this part, okay? But in our conversation, we had wholeness is when the way of your being matches the truth of your being. So the truth of your being is ontology. And the way of your being is your existential experience. And wholeness is when the way of your being, how you live out, actually matches the truth of your being. And the beauty of the Trinity is that we know things that are absolutely true about the ontology of God, the being of God, like God is love. Therefore, the way of God's being, since God is holy, whole, right? The way of God's being has to match that. We'll never not match it. So God cannot, if he is going to be holy, act contrary. The way of his being cannot be something that doesn't match the truth of his being. And so, many, so much of our journey is to try... We, we work so hard on the way of our being without realizing that the truth of our being is that we're made in the image and likeness of God. We think that the truth of our being is that we're totally depraved in a piece of defecation. So, because they don't have to bleep that out, you know. It's not like saying shit. So, so, so what is sin? And we've all heard missing the mark. But think about this. Is it missing the mark of our behavior or missing the mark of our ontology? Because we've made it about behavior. It's missing the mark of behavior. And that's not what sin is. Sin is ha martia. Ha is a negation. Martia is origin form. Um, Thayer's lexicon of Greek translated is is missing your destiny, which is grounded in your ontology. So, so th anything that denies the truth of your being is sin. And it expresses itself in the way of your being. But it, you can change all the, or you can try to self-discipline the way of your being all you want. But, it, but as long as you still believe lies about who you are, all you're going to do is behavior modification. And you'll, you'll wear out, you, it won't work, It'll only be good as, as long as you can kind of hold it together and then you'll have to hide the fact that, that you're faking your ontology. Because if you believe you're a piece of crap, you'll, it doesn't matter. You'll feel like a fake in terms of doing righteous things, being good, being kind. And then you'll be going to try to do that in order to please God so that you don't go to hell. So, so again, sin then is missing the mark of your ontology. Is it helpful? Cool, 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 cool. Now, in response to this morning, I wanted to just share one little thing with you. In, in 1731, just a couple years prior to revivals that he is well known for, this, this colonial preacher purchased Venus, a preteen African girl as his household slave. Years later, in leisure purchased by slave labor, he wrote sermons on the backside of his bill of sale, which we have a copy of. One about the joys of communion in the body of Christ. This is on the back of the bill of sale, right? One about the joys of communion in the body of Christ and another about the aims of preaching. In, in this last sermon, he says that God winks at our hypocrisies for a time but cuts us off if we won't turn from them once they're exposed. Years later, he wrote an explicit defense of slavery, arguing, among other things, that abolitionists were disputing his authority and so hurting the ministry of the gospel. 
and that Scripture does not expect us to treat everyone as our neighbor, only fellow Israelites. Oh, I didn't tell you who this was. Jonathan Edwards, who supposedly wrote the greatest sermon in America, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. There was a huge disconnect between his expression and his theology. Like Kim would say, my wife, she would say, don't care about theology, just care about incarnation. If you, if you don't live it, don't be telling me about it. Eh? So that was unbelievably amazing and beautiful and important this morning. Eh? So um, I'm on, I want to tell you a joke because Jim needs help. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I figured I'd give him a good one. So... And this plays right into, into the whatever that was that I was supposed to be talking about. And um, the good and beautiful God in the shack, which uh, is so vague, it's so great. And uh, so this guy gets to heaven, it's like a lot of those, you know, jokes, somebody gets to heaven and, and there's the pearly gates and uh, Peter is, you know, doing his, his shift and the guy gets there, and, but he's not sure what he's supposed to do. I mean, do you just like walk in through the pearly gates? Do you just like, you know, is there something, an entry exam? I don't know, you know. So, so Peter sees his consternation, comes out to talk to him. And the, and the, and the guy says, Peter, um, what am I supposed to do? I mean, do I just like walk in? And Peter goes, well, it depends. It depends. He says, it depends on something. Peter says, oh, yeah. He says, what does it depend on? Well, it depends on how many points you have. <gasps> I have to have points? He said, oh, yeah. Well, how many points do I have to have? Well, you need 100. I need a hun uh, only 100 points? Oh, yeah, that's all, 100 points. He said, okay. Well, as you know, Peter, for the last 10, 12 years, I've been working at the soup kitchen on Saturday nights, you know, helping with the poor, and, and I'm just there to just be a servant and... Peter goes, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a point for that. A point? <laughs> Peter, um, I was a pastor for 35 years, you know. I, I married people, and, and I preached, and I only took vacations when my contract said. And, and Peter goes, I don't know. He goes, Peter, 35 years. Peter goes, okay, I'll give you a point for that. <laughs> and now he's thinking, Oh my gosh, I've got two points. <laughs> and just then, this other guy shows up, and, and he recognizes him. He, he comes from the same town. He has a little coffee shop. He's a C&E Christian, you know, Chris, Christmas and Easter. And, and, and he's like a nice guy, but he just, you know, he's a, he owns a coffee shop downtown. And he, and he walks right past them, through the pearly gates and in. And he goes, Peter, are you telling me that that guy's got a hundred points? And Peter goes, oh no, he just doesn't play this game. <laughs> the reason that that's funny is because we resonate with that. Because a lot of us grew up being taught how to play the game. I have a favorite living um, poet right now. And um, I introduced him to the group yesterday afternoon. His name is David Tenson, T-E-N-S-E-N. -E he has a website with his poetry called davidtenson.com. And um, he's a young man, he's, in, he's an Aussie. And he's a musician as well, and a bunch of other things. But I thought I'd read you one of his poems. Let me pull this up here. Okay. And I've got the wrong one. Let's think about this Apple thing, right? <laughs> it can deceive you. So let me go down. I know. It's called The Wrestle. Give me a second here. Talk amongst yourselves. I have a lot of his poems. 
I, I sent him, uh, I, called, I texted him one time and I said, I've got this, I think I've got an idea for a poem that I think you should write. And, um, and I said, it's called, Who Stole Your Voice? Who Took Your Voice? And, and within, who oh, stole your voice? But within that same day, he wrote three unbelievably powerful poems about who took your voice. And, um, but the one that I want is called The Wrestle, and I think it's the second last one, so let me go down here. There it is! Thank you, Holy Spirit. So, um, I found you beyond the why, far from the why not, and worlds from why me. You held a space for me beyond answers to questions my pain had, as if you knew information was never going to heal or resolve or fix my suffering. Instead, you agreed to wrestle through many nights, never letting go, always with me, just like you promised. Refusing to surrender, I eventually realized that wrestling with God was not a crime, that it was in fact being healed by your embrace, being transformed by finding you beyond answers, being blessed by holding on to you in my doubt and frustration and never letting go. And you never let go. And you overcame me in the end, and we both won. Yeah. I wrote a story for my kids for Christmas, made the 15 copies at Office Depot that did everything I wanted it to do, and went back to work not one time thinking that I might one day be a published author. And after the craziness of the whole God's sense of humor, and because I was working three jobs and shipping out soldering tips and cleaning toilets, and I was absolutely content in my life. Joy had come as a constant companion. I was no longer addicted to anything, not even the gold-chained addictions like doing something great for God. And I am a missionary kid, preacher's kid, firstborn. That's a disaster for... That's a recipe for disaster. It's a disaster in waiting. And, uh, and uh, with all the kinds of childhood trauma and damage and then throughout my life and the choices that I made and all of that, there'd been this long process of coming to healing and I wrote a story as a gift because it was all I had that year to give my kids for Christmas. And... Um, I, I say, you know, that the shack is, is proof that God can still speak through Balaam's ass. I think I said that, but... Um, <laughs> and, um, and I've gotten to, to basically ride a wave that I don't originate. You know, it's like a, ri a river of living water that's just splashed into the world. And um, it's totally... Not totally, but... The people who have the most problem with it are my own people, so I feel completely safe. And a lot of times they're all talk, you know. So, um, and they got, they're stuck in their heads, and, and, and I understand what they're afraid of. I totally get it. Um, they're, they're afraid that if God is, if they take the risk that God is this kind of good, and they're wrong, then they've made a decision that affects their eternal destiny, right? And um, so, over the years, the conversation about it becoming a movie, in fact, the, the reason it got printed in the first place was because of a few guys in California who, when they read the first, one of the first manuscripts, um, immediately wanted to turn it into a movie, and that started this chain reaction. So, there came a point when we had to figure out how to go in different directions, because I had the rights to the movie, and, and, and from the beginning, I, was, I intended to give it to them. That was, that was part of the understanding. And we had to work out details, and that took a while. Um, um, I have this saying that success will bring more crap out of people than failure ever would. 
And because uh, it's a different kind of pressure, right? Um, abuse and abandonment is like crushing the bottle, forcing the air out, notoriety, platform, uh, money. It's like putting air into the bottle that expands it from the inside. And that will reveal flaws that, that crushing never would. Because as that air gets pumped into it, it expands. And if there are any flaws in that, it'll blow out right there. And, and so uh, sometimes I think God is part of the choreographer of success, knowing that that success will be the way to get to your heart because it will blow you out. You'll just take it and you'll, you'll begin to allow it to expand you from the, in, from, from the, like the bottle, from the inside. And so it, we, we worked it out. But I was in the middle of all this, the settlement agreement, which was part of the process, and I was flying on my way to L.A., for another round, and I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. And, and we talk all the time, actually. And, um, and she, she's very good about hanging around. So um, there's a constant sense of conversation. By the way, ruach in Hebrew is feminine, just so you know, from Genesis 1, starting in verse 2. Yeah? So the Holy Spirit, and it's all in feminine pronouns throughout the, the Hebrew scriptures. So it's, I'm not like, you know, totally a heretic. So, <laughs> so I've, never heard, I've never heard God, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit speak audibly to me, but I have friends who have, and I absolutely believe them, um, Jesus being one of them. And, um, and so... Uh, So, but I, I know the voice, and I hear, Paul, I think it's time to lay the movie down. And I said, okay. So I walk into a room full of lawyers, and they, and they, said, I th they said to me, we have two scenarios that I think will resolve this. And I said, I, th I have one. And they go, well, listen to ours first, because I'm sure it includes, you know, because we're so smart. And... Um, and I said, yeah, we did that with Augustine, Luther, and Calvin, too, and look what we got. And uh, a different scenario, but it wasn't helpful. So they gave us, in me, their scenario, and I said, no, I, I have another one. They went, what? I said, what if I lay the movie down, like 100%, no creative control, no rights, no income? 100%. And they said, you're crazy. Wait oh my goodness, that could actually work. And it did. I laid it down, and we were able to reform a settlement agreement, and we were able to walk away and turn our, turn our faces different directions. So you can understand that I didn't expect to be involved with the movie at all. And people would say, Paul, you gave up the rights? What if they make a really bad movie? And, I, and my response was from the beginning, look, I'm a modern evangelical missionary kid, preacher's kid. I used to know what God was always doing and told everybody. But I haven't been doing that for a long time. All I know is that everything that God is about is about love and kindness and goodness and long-suffering. And I said, so, if, if a crappy movie better serves the purposes of God, I'm in. So I had no expectations, which means I had no disappointments waiting around the corner. You learn to live without expectations. Everything's a gift. And so I'm about doing my own stuff when I get back from Korea on a book tour for Crossroads, and I get a phone call from Lionsgate. And they said, would you come talk to us? I said, sure. So I go to the top floor of a big building, and I'm with the CEO and, a, and all the top brass. And for two and a half hours, all we did is told stories and cried. It was amazing, because the book had already penetrated into their world. And I think, you know, I think in part they were just checking out the author to see if he was going to be a problem. I think that was part of the... Uh, but it didn't go there at all. And it was a sweet time, and I walked out going like, thank you. That was such a gift. And whenever I say, that was so cool to the Holy Spirit, I always hear the same thing. I always hear her say, 
whatever. <laughs> it's our joke. It, it, and it's a, it's a redemptive joke because when I was going through therapy and would call Kim and she was furious and I'd tell her what I was working on, she'd say, whatever. So it's a different kind of whatever. And so then I get a call from Gil Netter, Netter Productions, because the guys who I gave over the rights to resold them to Lionsgate and Netter Productions. And he says, Paul, would you come and just look at the script for us? And then they said, would you come talk to us about the actors? And then Lionsgate calls me and says, Paul, they're shooting it in British Columbia. Would you come on the first day shoot and pray a blessing over the entire cast and crew? And I did. Every piece of this was a gift. It was a kindness. The end of the first day shoot in White Rock, B.C., Gil Netter yells, Hey, Paul! I said, what? He said, you want to be in a cameo? Like in the movie cameo? He said, yeah, I never shot a movie based on a book, a book adaptation and the author was alive that I didn't put the author in it somewhere. I said, sure, my kids are going to love this. What do I have to do? He said, it's very simple. In the scene between Mackenzie and Willie, because the kids are being piled into the car, you know, when you shoot a movie, you don't shoot it in sequence, right? You shoot it when the actors are available. And so, you know, the, all the set locations are across the southern part of British Columbia. And the first day shoot was in White Rock, and they were doing the neighborhood scene. And they're piling the kids in the car. Uh, Tim McGraw, Willie, comes over with a dog, says, summer's last hurrah. You know, that's how the scene starts. And he says, we're going to have a, a, a shot on, on Tim, and all you have to do is walk through the scene behind him. You're just a guy in the neighborhood who just happens to be walking through. <laughs> Piece of cake, I've walked my whole life. <laughs> But the problem is I don't think about walking, I just walk. <laughs> and now I'm like thinking about walking and um, it only took five takes. <laughs> but when I got it right, it is the best damn walking you have ever seen. I mean, it, it, I'm in the movie for like two seconds, but if they had an Academy Award for walking, total shoe in, right? So, so then I went home and it was, ah, that was so great, whatever. So, um, so uh, two months later, I get another phone call from Lionsgate and they said, Paul, we're almost at the end of our shoot. We loved having you on set that day. Would you consider coming back? This is like a Monday. We're going to fly you up. We would like to fly you up Wednesday. We'll pick you up at Vancouver Airport. We'll take you to Chilliwack, where your hotel is, where you can spend the night. You'll get a call sheet telling you when we're picking you up, and then the next morning, we'll take you to the whatever site location we happen to be working on that day, which we don't know what that is yet, and we don't know what we're shooting yet. But... Um, uh, would you, you'll just spend all day Thursday on set and we'll fly you home Friday. I look at this, my calendar for that. I mean, this is this week, right? They call me on Monday and I'm open. And I said, yes, I'm in. They said, great. And within 20 minutes, they had it all set up. My flight lands at 11.30 in the morning on Wednesday into Vancouver. I'm sitting at my desk and I think, oh, wait a minute. They're putting me in a hotel in Chilliwack. And that's right next door to Abbotsford. And in Abbotsford is a theologian that I have been talking to through email, but I've never met. I wonder if he's in town because he spends a good chunk of his year in London as a seminary professor. His name is Brad Jerzak. And I'd met him only through his wife. So I went and spoke at uh, Eden's, when Brad stepped down from uh, being a pastor of a church, um, Eden stepped in, his wife. And so I'd spoken at their church, but Brad was in London. But we'd had these conversations. I'd endorsed his uh, A More Christ-like God, which is brilliant, and so is um, A More Christ-like Way, which just came out. And uh, he had been talking to me about Eve, working because he's a patristic theologian, um, and, and he's now um, shifted into an orthodox frame of reference. So I send him an email. Hey, Brad, I tell him what I'm doing. Do you happen to be in town? Could we grab coffee? Instantly get an email back 
and it says, can I pick you up at the airport? Because it's two and a half hours to Chilliwack. And I'm going like, yes. So he said, we'll have lunch together. We'll spend the afternoon talk shop theology. And then we'll go have supper with Eden. And I'll drop you off at your hotel. You can go about your stuff. And I told him what I was up there for. So it was all set. Two minutes later, get another email from Brad. This with a photograph on it. And he said, so I want to introduce you to one of my longtime best friends. This is Dwight. And, and Dwight's a business guy married to Lori. Dwight and Lori Martin. Lori is a spiritual formations director. And Dwight is the first person who told me about the shack and gave me my first copy. And they have a little summer cottage up at Cultus Lake, a central interior part of BC. And Eden and I have come up here to spend a week with them at their summer cottage. And while you and I were emailing, we were walking in the woods about two and a half blocks from his little summer cottage and look, and it had Dwight and Brad and it had this big fluorescent green arrow that said the shack. One of the set locations in British Columbia was two and a half blocks away from the summer cottage and they didn't know it and I'm I'm emailing them about coming up, and they run right into the set location. (laughs) You do know that humor originated in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not part of the fall. (laughs) Now, when you listen to Jim's jokes, you might think... (laughs) Bam! Bam. (laughs) So... (laughs) So I'm, I'm thinking, that's so cool. And then Brad adds at the bottom of the email, Paul, I don't know if it would be possible when you're up here, your book had an unbelievable impact in both Dwight and Lori's life. But even if you could spend 10 minutes with them, because three years ago, the youngest of their five children went into the woods and into a treehouse and gave her life back to God. And they're stuck. And Dwight believes that he could get unstuck if he could just read the shack again, but he hasn't been able to get past chapter one. He's stuck. And Lori is furious. She is so angry at God because her daughter is dead. She's so angry at herself. She's angry at the world. And if you could spend, I, he said, even 10 minutes. And I wrote back and I said, we'll figure it out. I don't know where I'm going to be, uh, but even if it meant s- staying an extra day, I mean, I'd do that. We'll figure it out. So I fly up. Brad meets me at the airport. It's like meeting a long lost brother. You know, one of those relationships. I was talking about it yesterday. and it's One of the gift relationships where you never have to work at it. It's just there. And, and so we talk shop. I mean, it was great. We had supper with Eden, and then Brad drops me off, and I tell him, I'm going to get the call sheet tonight, and then I'll, I'll let you know where I am, and then we'll figure out logistics, how to get together. 11.30 that night, I get the call sheet from the movie company. It says, we're going to pick you up at 9.30, and we're going to take you to the set location at Cultus Lake. <laughs> so I drive in... And one of the reasons that they wanted me to come back is that Cultus Lake, they had picked that spot. There had just happened to be this area of woods and around the lake that was fallow for a year. It had been privately owned, was being transferred to the provincial government as a provincial park. But it was a year vacant in between, and Lionsgate, looking for site locations, had run into it and said, here. And... So they were, as long as they returned it to, the, to how it was before, and you would not believe how good movie companies are at doing that. I mean, it's like they photographed every blade of grass and returned it to the way it was. But they built the shack there, and the lake scenes are there. And so they wanted me to see that. Now, when I went to um, White, uh, White Rock for the first day, um, Sumi wasn't there who plays the Holy Spirit. Octavia wasn't there who plays Papa. And Aviv wasn't there who plays, 
who plays Jesus. So the Trinity was absent from the first day set, you know, <laughs> in any kind of physical form anyway. And, and, uh, and so, but they were all going to be here. And so they invited me back to, to kind of surprise me and to show me and let me be a part of that. So I walk on set and I walk over to Gil and Lonnie Netter, the producers, and I walk and, and they're, in a, he's, they're in a little huddle with Stuart Hazeldean, the director, who had already become my friend from the first day that I was there. And I walk over to them and I say to them, oh, and I'd been texting Brad and he said, we have food ready for you, just let us know, we'll come down. Um, uh, and pick you up. Uh, we'll just walk down the waterfront, come pick you up, and take you back to the cottage for some, something to eat. And so just let us know. So I walk over to these three, and I say, look. And I tell them this situation, and I say, would there be any possibility that my four friends could come on set for the day? And not only did they say yes, they said, oh, absolutely. So 20 minutes down the waterfront, comes Dwight and Lori, Brad and Eden, and they step onto the, this whole area, set location, and I give Lori a hug, and I don't let her go. Not right away. And I could feel the fury. Later, I come to find out she did not want to be there. Because when you are in the midst of that, you're sort of like a a porcupine where all your quills are infected and you touch anything and it triggers you, right? And now she's coming on to this and into the woods and, and, I, and I felt something shift a little bit. They come onto the set. Now, when they shoot a movie, they, like I said, they don't shoot it in sequence, but our schedule said they're going to shoot one scene all morning long. So they're going to take a scene and then they're going to shoot it over and over and over and over, right? Because they're going to get all the different camera angles, different sound, different expressions by the actors. And later they're going to edit all of those things, pick the best of the best, and eventually that's how a movie comes together. And so um, I had no idea what we were going to see. And they were shooting outdoor shots outside the shack, you know, on the front and on the porch and stuff like that. And so you couldn't get close because of all the lighting and camera and all that kind of stuff, and you couldn't hear them because they were all mic'd up, boomed mic and all that. But the producer and the director have what's called Video Village, which is a big, huge, movable tent that they sit inside with huge monitors with headphones on so that they can see the actual shot and direct it from inside of the tent, from Video Village. I didn't ask them, but without even asking, they immediately set up five chairs in front of the monitors with headphones so that we could be absolutely engaged with what they were doing. So it was one scene being shot all morning, lunch, one scene all afternoon, supper, and then an evening scene. Don't know what we're gonna get, we're gonna watch, right? So we go sit down, I'm on one end, Brad's on the other end, the three are in the middle, put our headphones on, and here's the scene. Now. Part of the reason that I, I wanted to go here was because Jim started our time this week with a clip. You know, the clip that was in the kitchen about the nail scars in Papa's wrists? And uh, that was an indoor scene. So we're going to watch two scenes. And the second in the afternoon is going to be the scene right after the one that Jim showed. And then the scene I'm going to tell you about right now is before in the sequence of the movie. In the movie sequence, Mackenzie has got his first night at the shack, and he's, he has, I mean, he has nightmares. Remember his flying dream, and he just crashes into the mud, and then he sees Missy, his daughter, and, and, and she's yelling, Daddy, Daddy, and he's running, but he can't get his feet to move, and, and so he wakes up from that nightmare, and all the angst of that, plus he's confused about where he is exactly, and whose company he's keeping. It's just like... What is going on? And he, and he comes out from inside onto the porch, and Papa's got breakfast for him. This is the scene we are going to watch. We watch it from, from roll is when he's coming out the door, right? And Papa's singing, only love can break your heart, right? You like Neil Young? He's okay. I'm especially fond of him. Is there anybody you're not especially fond of? 
No, not that I can think of. How do you sleep? Fine. Right? The word that covers all repressed emotions, you know? <laughs> it's the most important word that a man knows. Well, the, the, the most important s single syllable word, the, the two syllable word is okay. So, um, fine. And she says, Mackenzie, dreams are important. Sometimes they're a way of opening up the window, letting the bad air out. He just sits down. You can see the turmoil on his face and the repressed fury. And he says, so don't you ever get mad at him? Oh, sure. What parent doesn't? Well, what about your wrath? My like, what? And he starts a conversation which is an accusation on his part. And finally, she turns to him and she says, Mackenzie, the fundamental flaw in your life is that you don't believe that I'm good. I am. And I am at work in everything you consider to be a mess for your good. But until you trust that I am good, until you believe that I am good, you're never going to be able to trust me. And he says, why would I ever trust you? My daughter is dead. And there is nothing you can do to change that. And he gets up and he smashes the glass off the table and he walks out. And we're in Video Village going, <gasps> and I glance over at Lori and Dwight and they're like, <gasps> and they say, cut, reset. And we watch it again. And we watch it again. The third time, Lori gets up and walks out of the tent and falls completely apart. I, I followed her out and just held on to her. And then she walks back in and sits down and watches it again and watches it again and watches it again. Why would I ever trust you? My daughter is dead until you believe that I'm good. I'm at work in everything you consider to be a mess. But until you can believe that I'm good, you, you won't trust me. Why would I ever trust you? My daughter is dead. We break for lunch and overcomes Octavia and wraps them up in her big warm embrace and overcomes Sumi, the Holy Spirit, and hugs on him and overcomes Aviv Valouche who plays Jesus and just loves on them. And we break after lunch, go back, and we sit in Video Village to watch the second scene. And it's the one right after the nail scars where Mackenzie's sitting on the porch and Pop comes out and goes, see that bird, Mackenzie? That bird was created to live loved. I mean, that bird was created to fly. You were created to live loved. But sometimes pain as a way of clipping your wings and you forget you were ever created to fly. Why did you bring me here? Because here is where you got stuck. And we are bawling in Video Village. And we watch it over and over and over and over. That night as they're hugging me goodbye, they're saying, Paul, you have no idea. And I'm like, duh. But I'm thinking, without the violation of one human will, look at the orchestration and the choreography of God. I had no rights. I didn't have to be involved. I could have never been involved at all. I ended up in Hollywood with no agenda, which is like unheard of. <laughs> and, and God weaves into the hearts of, of a movie company and they invite me in and because of that, oh, and they, and, they, and they invite me back to a second time. Oh, and I get this nudge, you know, to contact Brad because I, I'd like to meet him. And oh, he's not only in town, he's walking in the woods and they run into a, a set for the shack while he's, and he's with two broken-hearted people and, and they get to be invited in and those are the scenes that we get to see shot 
God is only good. There is no shadow in the character and nature of God. We brought the shadow world into that circle of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We introduced it. There was no suffering there. And we were created in the middle and have always existed in Him. We live and move and have our being in Him. All of creation does. All of creation is created in Him. And we introduced the suffering. And He ran to it. Not away from it. Because He loves you. There is a God who is good all the time involved in the details of our life. They got unstuck. Lori now does this gathering that Brad and I speak at called the Grand Embrace. Another one's coming in a month or so. And she calls it the Grand Embrace because of that first hug I gave her when she walked onto the set. And she's able to talk about her loss and her grief and she's able to have worked through it. And this has become such a healing community. You're never going to be able to trust me until you believe that I'm good. And that means we have to dismantle every vestige of theology that suggested otherwise. And that's what's in Jim's heart. That's what's in my heart. We want to declare the goodness of God. This is a God who is love. And we're made in that image and we are like that and we don't know it. May the Holy Spirit open up all of our inside eyes so that we would begin to catch a glimpse of the heights and the depths and the widths of the goodness of God. And may we, in the way of our being, become the truth of our being. That is, the fragrance of Christ to God. To the praise of his glory. Amen.